Good morning, everyone, and welcome to worship today on this, the first Sunday in Advent. We are delighted that you have come into this time to be with us as we gather as God's people, to light candles, to offer prayer, to speak the word, to be with each other, separate and yet united, as we worship together. We begin by bringing light, the light of the Christ, as we light our Christ candle. This light reminds us that God is with us as we worship, that the light can penetrate any darkness, and that we are held in that light. We also recognize that we are worshiping on the traditional territories of the Chippewas of the Saugeen, and we are grateful for their stewardship of the land both before and now. We come into this time of worship and we begin in this season of Advent with the lighting of the Advent candles. The poet Emily Dickinson wrote, Hope is the thing with feathers that perches in the soul. The psalmist declared, I put my hope in you all day long. Hope is more than wishful thinking. Hope is the spirit of God dwelling within us, reminding us we are never alone. Hope is our active commitment to be God's faithful people, whether we walk an easy path or face fiery trials. When we light the candle of hope, we embrace God's presence among us yesterday, today, and always. Whatever we face in life, we put our hope in God. join in our call to worship. We gather in this time of waiting that we call Advent to reflect upon our lives, to reflect upon our faith, our past, our present, and our future. We gather to support each other through this coming season of Advent and Christmas. It is joyful for some and sorrowful for others. We gather to reset ourselves on our faith journey within our Christian family, within the church. So let us worship God, who gives us Jesus the Christ, Emmanuel, God with us, who was alive in the past, who is in our present, and who was also in our future. Let us worship God as we pray. God of mystery, sometimes we, like children, are full of excitement and anticipation. We gather and worship wondering what new insight will set us, will set upon us as suddenly as a thief in the night. What part of the worship experience will touch us in a profound way? Open our awareness so that we might discover the nuances that point us to the Bethlehem stable. Open our hearts that we might be receptive to your good news. We pray in the name of the much longed for Christ. Amen. Let us join in singing together hymn number two in Voices United, Come Thou Long Expected Jesus. Israel's 
Today's Old Testament scripture reading is from Isaiah 64, verses 1 to 9. Oh, that you would tear open the heavens and come down, so that the mountains would quake at your presence, as when fire kindles brushwood, and the fire causes water to boil, to make your name known to your adversaries, so that the nations might tremble at your presence. When you did awesome deeds that we did not expect, you came down, the mountains quaked at your presence. From ages past, no one has heard, no ear has perceived, no eye has seen any God besides you. Who works for those who wait for him? You meet those who gladly do right, those who remember you in your ways. But you were angry and we sinned, because you hid yourself, we transgressed. We have all become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous deeds are like a filthy cloth. We all fade like a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind take us away. There is no one who calls on your name or attempts to take hold of you. For you have hidden your face from us and have delivered us into the hand of our iniquity. Yet, Lord, you are our father. We are the clay and you are our potter. We are all the work of your hand. Do not be exceedingly angry, O Lord, and do not remember iniquity forever. Now consider, we are all your people. New Testament reading is from Mark 13, verses 24 to 37. But in those days after that suffering, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will be falling from heaven and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. Then he will send out the angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. From the fig tree learn its lessons. As soon as the branch becomes tender and pits forth its leaves, you know that summer is near. So also, when you see these things taking place, you know that he is near at the very gates. Truly, I tell you, this generation will not pass away until all these things have taken place. Heaven and earth will pass away but my words will not pass away. But that, about, about that day or hour, no one knows, neither the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. Beware, keep alert, for you do not know when the time will come. It is like a man going on a journey when he leaves home and puts his slaves in charge each with his work, and commands the doorkeeper to be on the watch. Therefore, keep awake, for you do not know when the master of the house will come, in the evening, or at midnight, or at cock crow, or at dawn, or else he may find you asleep when he comes suddenly. And what I say to you I say to all, keep awake. This is the word of God. Yeah. 
Our news this week has been all about COVID. Rising numbers, over 61 million people in the world right now have contracted COVID. 1.4 million people have died from it. And in Canada, 356,000 people so far and rising dramatically every day. The Atlantic bubble burst. Lockdowns are enforced. Strong political reactions to questions about how the governments have been handling this crisis. Leaked tapes in Alberta of the chief medical officer and a damning Auditor General's report in Ontario about provincial governments about our provincial government's response to the pandemic. And it all continues to add to the uncertainty, showing us chaos in our daily lives. We are also hearing about the side effects of living in a pandemic, like the higher rate of overdose victims because of the COVID closed borders, drugs being sold on the street are laced with more dangerous drugs like fentanyl, and more people are dying because of it. One person a day dies in Vancouver due to overdose. The mental strain of living eight months in a pandemic was also a news topic this past week. How living in a pandemic is leading to higher anxiety and more depression. The mental toll of living in times such as these is huge. The uncertainty of knowing what's safe, who's safe, how to live life and not get exposed to the virus is on our minds all the time. I find myself waiting each morning for Ontario to release its numbers and then in the afternoon checking the local health unit for our county's numbers. When I heard that one staff in my local nursing home of Golden Dawn and Lion's Head tested positive, my tension increased. My daughter's skating coach called a parents meeting this past Tuesday. Everyone was in masks. Everyone social distanced. And she shared why she chose to cancel skating the previous week. There had been pushback from some of the parents about the cancellation. So she stood in the midst of the arena hall in her skates and her mask, and she talked about how hard it has been for her family, about how scared she is, about how after learning that there was a case, a positive case of COVID in the Lion's Head School, she could not bring herself to leave her home to come to the arena and coach that week. She thought she could, but by Tuesday afternoon, she could not force herself to get into her car. Her voice broke as she told us this. There were tears in her eyes. It was a raw and a vulnerable moment. It was an honest moment, and everyone in the room recognized it and respected it. This fear, this anxiety, this stress and tension is what we all have been living this past eight months. It ebbs and flows, but it is always there underneath everything. And I think we need to remember this and give ourselves and each other a break because it is hard, hard, hard living in times such as these with restrictions and lockdown and stress and tension and anxiety and concern and the days keep getting shorter and there's less and less sunlight. And we are about to go deeper into the December darkness. The people to whom Isaiah is speaking this morning are living in something very similar as well. They have been conquered 
about 70 years ago now, and they are scattered all over the ancient Mediterranean world, and they are now under new leadership of foreign powers. They have been allowed to return to Jerusalem and the surrounding areas and rebuild their home and restore the temple and return to some semblance of the nation and people whom they used to be. These people of Isaiah's time are also living in a time of high stress and tension and anxiety and uncertainty. David Lowe speaks about what it is to live in these times. Here's the thing he writes. This year has brought into sharp relief the fragility of the lives we have made for ourselves and reminded us painfully that we are not on our own sufficient to the challenges of life in this world. Isaiah's cry in the first reading, Oh, that you would tear open the heavens and come down, is our cry, even if we have a hard time giving voice to it. Isaiah's plea to God is as simple as it is stark. Show up and do something, God, you know, like, God, like you used to when you rescued Israel from Egypt. And we would like God well, preferably God, but we'll take anyone at this point to do the same, to show up and do something. He wants someone to come and rescue us from this terribly complex set of circumstances that is our world today. We want things to go back to the way they were when we had some sense of certainty, when we thought we understood what tomorrow might bring. We want a reset to go back to February 2020 when the virus was over there and all about China. And we could not even imagine what the last eight months would bring. We want to be able to imagine what tomorrow will bring. And truthfully, we can't. We can't even figure out whether or not we can gather in our homes with our families and celebrate the coming of the Christ this Christmas. And I don't know whether it brings you comfort or not to realize that both of our readings remind us that this feeling, this uncertainty, is not new. The people of Isaiah's time, the people of Mark's time, they too, just like us, are living in times of high anxiety and uncertainty and fear. But is there something that we need to know by looking back at the people in today's readings? That is, we always in the midst of despair, in the midst of insecurity, in the crazy that was their reality, that is our reality, God was there. God was with them. They were not alone. They were never, ever alone. That's kind of what this season of Advent is about. God getting into the world in spite, in spite of the despair, in spite of the crazy, in spite of the chaos, God comes, God is coming, and God has come. Advent. Advent is a time of waiting, an expectation of hope, waiting for Jesus to come both as a baby in a manger and also as a promise, a promise of the coming of God. Advent is the time when we remember that we need to be ready for the coming of God into our world, living into the paradox of it has already happened and it is still to come, living the mystery of our faith that we proclaim each and every time we have communion. Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ will come again. And this paradox is so central to our readings this morning. As all the communities we encounter, the community in Isaiah's time, the community in Mark's time, our community now are living in the midst of chaos and turmoil, and yet they are calling out to God, looking back in time, and at the same time calling on a time yet to be when God's way is the way, and justice and righteousness prevails, and God's will is done on earth as it is in heaven. Mark's gospel was written in a time of calamity during the rebellion called the Jewish Wars of 66 to 74 CE, when the streets were literally burning. Persecution, destruction, and death were a reality for everyone. Again, people were looking back to remember God's faithfulness in order to find hope for their future, which appeared so bleak. But the people of Mark's time have the same feeling as the people of Isaiah's time, of our time, that there is something more, 
something different, something about to come that will change the sorrow and the grief, that will transform the anxiety and the fear into hope and joy. That God is about to break into the world. That is why the visions of end times are actually visions of new beginnings. A colleague shared this about Advent. She writes, Advent is not mentioned in the Bible. Advent is a theological space which allows us a quantity of time, a space, if you will, to breathe in how God comes to us through a baby. Advent is four weeks of space to breathe in the reality that the Christ is coming as a baby in a manger, that Emmanuel, God with us, is coming, has come, and will come again. Advent is a space that allows God to get in a space to welcome in what is about to happen. Because here's the thing, even though we are living in a crazy world, we live in God's world. There is hope. This is the Advent promise, is here and now and always. Something is about to happen, and this something has to do with God, and this something has to do with us, and God is about to burst into our world and take us all by surprise. Thomas Long, on that day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. What this means, starkly put, is that God's future will not arrive when we want it, or plan it, or even think we need it. It will come not according to our timetable, but in God's own good time. The coming of the kingdom is a promise, and it cannot be turned into a set of predictions. God does not provide happy endings for the futures we are engineering. God provides a future beyond even our knowledge and control, and not even the angels in heaven know the hour of its coming, so be prepared. God is getting into the world in God's time. Trust that. So take heart and know deep, deep, deep in your bones that God is here. God is with us. God is coming. Advent. So I'm going to leave you with a poem. I entitled this sermon, Hope is a Star, because of the Advent hymn that accompanied the candlelight. This hymn reminds us that hope is a shining thing in the darkness that is not extinguished just because we can't see it. It is always there. And I'm going to end this sermon with a poem that is my wish for you in this strange and different Advent season. Star Giving by Anne Weems. What I'd like to give you for Christmas, and I'd like to give this to you for Advent, is a star. Brilliance in a package. Something you can keep in the pocket of your jeans or in the pocket of your being. Something to take out in times of darkness. Something that would never snuff out or tarnish. Something you could hold in your hand. Something for wonderment. Something for pondering. Something that would remind you what Christmas has always meant. God's Advent light into the darkness of this world. But stars are only for God's giving. And I must be content to give you words and wishes and packages without stars. But I can wish you life as radiant as the star that announced the Christ child's coming and filled us with awe as the shepherds who stood beneath its light. And I can pass on to you the love that has been given to me ignited countless times by others who have knelt in the Bethlehem light. Perhaps if you ask, God will give you a star. Amen. Let us pray. God, in this Advent season of hope and expectation, may we carry your hope into lives chilled by unrelenting darkness, May we encourage others to expect good things and then ensure by what we do that they are not disappointed. There is so much darkness in our world, so many folk for whom hope has long been extinguished. The darkness of war and injustice, of oppression and want. The darkness of fear and rejection, of violence and hate. 
the darkness of loss and loneliness, of longing and need. So much darkness and so little hope. Lift up those eyes, O God, that are downcast. Rekindle hope that has all but died. Do a new thing, O God. Confound our expectations and surprise us with joy, the joy of those who know that the God of Advent comes to change the world. Open us up, loving God, to receive this gift of transformation as we pray together. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Let us pray. We place our hope in these gifts gracefully given loving god and you place your hope in us as gifts are used our hope of skills and talents well used our hope of loneliness compassion overcome our hope of worship faithfully offered our hope of neighborhood needs joyfully met our hope of mission projects that bring new life we realize that with our gifts comes our commitment to serve in the way of jesus so we ask you, loving God, to offer your loving blessing to our service. Amen. In the midst of the gray and the dreary days of November, we find ourselves waiting. Warm us, O oh God, with the hope of Advent. Chase away the chills and surprise us with love. Surprise us with hope. Brace us as we leave this time to live with great expectation. Go with us, loving God. Surround us in your love. Empower us through the Christ and strengthen us through the Holy Spirit. Amen. Blessings, everyone, on your week. Mm -hmm.